Okay, so you're nodding. How do you, how do you know about cooperative extension? Um, I'm trying to think. I've taken some, some workshops in the past. Uh -huh. um, and I, we don't live, I don't live too far from UNH, so. Okay. Um, so I don't have to website. Except for resources, actually, for gardening resources. Okay, great. Yeah. Great. Awesome. Anybody else know about cooperative extension? If I went to Adway and I did a um, seminar on chicken. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay, so somebody did a uh, raising chicken seminar. Okay. Great. Great. Anything else? I was calling to the full line and talked to them about the Metro Gardener. Yes. That's great. Right. And if you picked up one of the little cards um, that's kind of white with lots of different colors mm -hmm. on it, that's our education center and info line that, that you're talking about. Um, this is a um, toll free number that you can call um, if you have any questions around your family home or garden. Uh, you can also email us questions, and it's staffed by uh, Master Gardeners, and they can help answer your question. And if they don't know the answer to it, um, this is what I like to say about cooperative extension in general. If, you don't, if, you, if we don't know the answer, we have such a good connection with all different agencies in the state, we can usually get you going in the right direction or connect you with those people that you really need to talk to. Um, just to kind of give you a 30-second commercial about cooperative extension, um, you know, at the University of New Hampshire, part of their mission is to provide um, graduate and undergraduate degrees. So academics is a very strong part of the university. They also do a lot of research. But then another part of the university's mission is to take all that research and knowledge and bring it out to the citizens of New Hampshire. So that's where cooperative extension comes in. We take all that information, we put it into real practical terms so that you can actually use that um, also. Uh, we focus on four main areas, um, food and agriculture, which is where I fit in. Um, I do, uh, in addition to doing um, food preservation programs, I do a lot of food safety training with restaurant staff, school food service, the New Hampshire Food Bank, um, so that's part of it. Um, and then we also work with our um, growers and our farmers in the state, so we have all this delicious produce that we're gonna be able to, to preserve, hopefully, after tonight. Um, the other areas we work in is natural resources, so we help landowners manage their property, so we keep New Hampshire looking as beautiful as it is. Uh, we work with families and youth, 4-H comes out of Cooperative Extension. That's a youth program where we teach youth leadership skills. And then the last area we work in is with um, communities and economic development. So we help communities vision for the future and look for those different growth opportunities. So we kind of cover a wide range of topics, um, but tonight we're going to focus on um, preserving food. So how many of you have actually done food preservation before, some kind of canning? Okay, oh, okay, so we do have some experienced canners here, that's great. What kind of things have you preserved? Jellies. Jellies, okay. That's a nice spirit, very nice. Pickles. Pickles, okay. Peaches. You've done peaches? Mm -hmm. Great, that was a great year for peaches this year. Anybody else? Some spaghetti sauces. Okay. Um, and marinara sauces. Very good. Okay. Anybody else? So why, why do you preserve food? What, what, what are some of the reasons that made, you know, wanted to, you wanted to do this type of thing? Uh, you know, fresh product in the middle of the winter. Exactly, because it does help you maintain that fresh New Hampshire peach taste, you know, in December or January when the peaches aren't really very good at that point of the year. So, so yeah, so it's something to look forward to in, in you know, in later months. Other reasons? Right. Exactly. That's very typical that you have an overabundance and you can't use it all at once, so you do want to save it so you don't have to, you know, throw it out or turn red because you've been eating too many tomatoes. <laughs> yeah, the same tomato that you grow in your garden that it doesn't taste like a tomato you get in the store. Right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. No. Right, it's, it's just the taste difference, it's, it's huge. It's very good because it's Christmas gifts also, the jellies and jams, and mm -hmm. people love it. Mm -hmm. right. Anybody do it because they really want to know where their food comes from? Mm -hmm. okay. So a lot of times people, you know, <coughs> we get food from all over the world these days in the grocery store, so it's really nice to be able to know that, yep, these pickles came right from, you know, I know the farm that they came from, and you know I I know how they've been um, what's gone into them, so I know that um, you know they're safe to eat um, and that they're they're going to be delicious. Um, how about cost? Does anybody do it to save money? It it could save money. It could not. It just depends on um, 
on how you look at it because you know we're going to talk a little bit of the equipment that's needed for canning sometimes there is that upfront investment for all the jars and the lids and the equipment that you need um, then you have to think about um, you know if you're purchasing the produce or if you're growing it yourself there's also that time involved in growing it the cost of seeds and fertilizer you know um, soil amendments uh, so sometimes canning is not always cheaper than what you can get at the grocery store um, so it, it just depends, but there are lots of benefits from it. How about, does anybody care like just because it's fun? You know, that's that's why I, I can most of the time, because it is, it's fun. I don't do it a lot, but when I do, it's it's kind of a nice, nice day. So when we uh, look at the different ways you can preserve food at home, um, you can can it, which is such a, these jars here. You can pickle it. Uh, you can make jams and jellies, you can freeze it, or you can dry it. So those are your main methods of, of preserving foods for, for the long, long periods of longer periods of time. The reason why we preserve foods, or want to preserve foods, is because, of course, we don't want it to spoil. Because if it spoils, we can't eat it then. Um, and there's several types, of, or several types of food spoilers. You can get molds and yeasts on food. Um, what's nice about those is you can actually see the mold. Um, you know, you might smell it too. Um, there's definitely changes in appearances and texture. Things get mushy, so you know, oh, they're not so good anymore. Um, but then there's also bacteria that can get into food. And unfortunately, a lot of times with bacteria, you can't see it, you can't smell it, you can't taste it. And you don't realize that you consume that bacteria until a couple of days later when you might have a foodborne illness and have you know, symptoms of nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, that kind of thing. The other thing that um, canning does is it does remove the oxygen from the jar, so it creates a vacuum seal, and that prevents bacteria, other bacteria, from getting into it at a later date. So that's why we want to make sure when we can things, we always have a nice seal on it so it doesn't become contaminated later. Now, in order for bacteria to grow, it needs several things. And you can remember it by this an acronym, BACTON. So for bacteria to grow, it always needs a food source. Um, and then bacteria typically don't like to grow in acid types of foods, um, things that you know have a lot of vinegar in them or lemon juice. Bacteria doesn't really grow very well. But it does grow well like on chicken and beef and eggs and fish and milk and all those kinds of things that you know you have to keep refrigerated to kind of keep that uh, bacteria from growing. Bacteria does need some time to grow, um, and it also needs the right temperature. And you know that if you leave, um, say if you have leftover foods and you leave it out at room temperature, bacteria is going to start to grow on that, and that food could make you sick. So it's important to you know keep you know cold foods cold or hot foods hot. And higher temperatures will actually kill bacteria. But when you keep foods at room temperature between 41 and 135 bacteria can grow very rapidly. And when we think about our canned goods, how do we usually store these? Room temperature, right? So this is like could be a prime place for bacteria to grow when you know it's growing in there. Um, some bacteria need oxygen to grow, some don't. And the one that's typically found in canned goods does not need oxygen, but they all need moisture. Um, if you think about like a box of rice, um, you can store that on the cupboard shelf. You don't have to worry about it because it's dry. There's no moisture in there. But once you cook it and you add water to it, then you know you need to keep that in the refrigerator. So true or false? If you grow it, you can preserve it at home. That's true or false? True. I get false. Okay. Okay. It's actually sort of a loaded question. <laughs> because it's going to depend on a lot of different things of whether or not you can actually preserve food um, and how you preserve it. So the first thing you have to think about is the food itself. Some foods are just not made for food preservation. Um, for example, lettuce. You can't freeze lettuce because it just goes to mush, all right? Same thing with zucchini. Zucchini does not really do well with food preservation. There's no recipe to can zucchini. Um, when you freeze zucchini, you have to do it in slices, mm, they get really kind of mushy after a while. Um, it works okay if you grate it and then you can use it for um, zucchini bread, that works all right. Um, you can make zucchini pickles, that's okay. 
but to canned zucchini or to really freeze it, it doesn't, it's just a food that doesn't do well. So some foods just don't preserve very well. Um, the other thing you want to think about is can I actually process it safely? If I want to put it in a jar, I've got to make sure that I can process it safely. A lot of times people will ask me, well, can I can pesto? Unfortunately, there are no USDA tested recipes for pesto, for canning pesto. The reason for that is, is it's just a very thick type of product. Um, the whole acidity level in there is a problem. So the best way to preserve the pesto is to freeze it. And I find that if you put it in a, a nice cube tray, and then you, once it's frozen, you can pop those cubes out and then just use those cubes individually in spaghetti sauce, that that works very nicely. But unfortunately, there's no way to put on canned pesto. Uh, you want to think about your storage options. Uh, do I have the cupboard space to store quarts and quart jars of, of a product? Or if I want to freeze, do I have a freezer big enough to handle things? Um, this year, I was able to pick um, probably about eight, you know, those gallon freezer bags full of wild blueberries. My freezer has stopped the blueberries. And that's all I have in my freezer right now is because my freezer is pretty small, but the blueberries get, you know, preference. So, um, but that's all I've got in my freezer right now. So you want to think about your storage um, spaces. After a while, it was like, oh my gosh, we, can't, we have to stop picking blueberries so there's just no more room in the freezer to do this, you know. Um, you want to think about the preparation time. When you do canning, you really have to plan for about two to three hours, depending on how much you're going to produce and, and what you're going to produce. Canning takes a long time to do. Freezing, usually that's pretty quick. You know, you can freeze things, oh, maybe half hour at the most that it would, would take to do that. So you have to think about your time. Um, some people like, really like canned green beans. I don't like canned green beans at all. I freeze my green beans when I do that. So it really depends on what kind of, how you like that product. Um, and so that will determine what method you use. <coughs> now there's two types of canning um, methods. Um, you have what's known as your boiling water um, method. Um, and that's done in a boiling water canner like this. Boiling on um, anything that has a, um, a um, pH of 4.6 or lower, those are considered acid foods, you can do in a boiling water canner. So that includes things like fruits, all your fruits you can do in a boiling water canner, jams and jellies, and then pickles, um, as well as tomato products too. So those can all be done in a boiling water canner. The other type of canning is with a pressure canner. Now those are that's done for um, foods that have a low acid. And um, with the pressure canner, basically what happens is the I know, you'll see a picture of it later, but because it's um, um, low acid, you have to get the contents of the jar high enough to kill botulism in it. Yeah. High enough? The temperature, Simple. temperature high enough, right, in, in the pressure canner. And the only way that you can get the temperature in the canner above 212 from a boiling water canner <coughs> is to you know, seal it down and have, it, have the contents come under pressure. So when you're doing things like green beans, when you're doing um, corn, or if you're doing any kind of meats or seafood, those carrots would be another example, beets. Um, those would be all examples of foods you have to do in a pressure canner. You cannot do green beans in a boiling water canner. Because it's okay. And the reason for that, as I mentioned, is because of clostridium botulinum or causing a botulism. So remember, with the boiling water temperatures that are in the boiling water canner, the highest it's going to go up to is 212. Um, and that will help kill, you know, yeasts and mold and most bacteria. However, with botulism, what happens is it forms a spore. And basically what a spore is, is the, like the bacteria is inside and on the outside it has a protective coating on it. And that heat, that 212 degree heat, is not hot enough to penetrate that coating and then kill the vegetative matter or the bacteria that's inside that, that spore. So what you have to do is you have to get the water temperature above 240. And as I mentioned, the only way that you can do that is that with the pressure canner. Um, and that's an example of what a pressure canner looks like. Um, there is another type. This is what's known as a dial gauge pressure canner. 
And um, there is another type that has a weight on it and the weight jiggles. Um, that's called a weighted gauge. So either one of those would be fine. But any of your low acid foods, um, you have to do in a pressure canner. Okay. Um, and yeah, you know these you can purchase, but they're usually about a hundred dollars or so to purchase. So if you want to do green beans, you know you really have to to think, okay, how many, how much green beans am I going to do, and is it do I really want to use that? If you have an old canner, you do need to have those dial gauge gauge checked every year. Um, I can do that for you. Um, so it's just a matter of just getting in contact with me, and we can set something up. Or you can actually mail those to our education center, and they will um, test them for you. And then if you include the return postage, they'll, they'll mail that back to you. So they're located right in uh, Glasstown too. So you could just go for here, from here. It's not too far to Glasstown. I have a question: that, um, the electric you know, are those able to be used for canning? Um, no, because um, the, is it a smaller size? A six quart. Six quart. Yeah, that's that's a pretty small one. These are these are much bigger than that. So the can the pressure canners need to be at least this big. So if you have one that's more like a saucepan that you can do to do right, it, it's 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 hard. You can't get very many jars. You can't get many jars in there. Usually, maybe one if you're lucky. But it doesn't control the temperature right, like a, like a regular pressure canner does. So you want to make sure you have an actual canner and not a soft canner cooker. And usually, you have to do those right on the stove. Now, when it comes to canning, um, a lot of times people will call me and they'll say, Alice, I have this great recipe from my grandmother. I want to make this. Can I do this? Is it going to be safe? And unfortunately, I have to tell them, well, if you're going to make it and put it in the refrigerator, that's fine. But if you want to actually put it in a jar and process it, it has to be a USDA tested recipe. Um, with um, canning recipes, you know, if you go on the internet or you know, there's tons of all these different recipes. I would strongly caution that you do not use them. Um, the reason for that is that they haven't been tested. And when you go to make your product, you know, whether, whether it's pickles or jams and jellies or spaghetti sauce, you want it to come out as a high quality product and you want it to be safe to eat. And the only ones that are safe are the ones that have been USDA tested. So the resources that we have for those tested recipes are this USDA Complete Guide to Home Canning. All right, you can purchase this, um, but all of these recipes are also online. Um, the other one is the Ball Blue Book, which is kind of yellow now. <laughs> um, make sure it's a current Ball Blue Book. Um, there's a lot of old ones out there, and. Um, you know, they're, they're great to keep for historical reasons, but you do want to make sure that you, you know, get a current copy. And what's nice is these are very easy to pick up right in Agway or in a little kind of, um, a local, you know, store that sells candy supplies. And then the other one is the So Easy to Preserve book, which is very similar to the USDA book. This comes out of the um, University of Georgia. They're the um, university that does all the testing of recipes. And um, I just read that they are coming out with their sixth edition um, very soon. Uh, so this would be another resource. Again, all of these recipes on here online. Um, if you've got one of the um, fact sheets on the bottom of it, it'll say the guidelines are from the National Center for Home Food Preservation. If you just Google that, you can go there and it has um, all the recipes. It has directions on how to can. It has videos and um, uh, slideshows on, on canning. So those would all be um, other things that you know you could look at and um, be good resources for you. So, but be wary of the, the internet. Um, I actually went to um, a site because it intrigued me. I wanted to see what what they did, and it was like canning tomatoes without water bathing. So what the person did was I was watching them make the the um, tomatoes, and there were like so many things that they did wrong in this YouTube video. And the last thing they did is after they kind of cranked the, the screw band on really tight, they said, just <coughs> put it here on the counter and, you know, in 24 hours it'll be fine. It was like, basically what they did was an old method called open canning kettle, or open kettle canning. And she would just take the hot tomato sauce from the pot, pour it in the jar, put on the lid and screw it on, and then put it on the shelf. And that used to be an old, it's an old method, it used to be safe, it is no longer safe to do that. 
Um, we're going to talk about how to have a can properly. But um, so there's lots of stuff out there, but I would be very careful with it because a lot of it is misinformation and the recipes that are not going to give you a good product. And I think for all the time it takes to do this and all the money I spend on the produce to put in the jars, I want it to be good and I want it to be able to last. Sure. Oh, yeah, yeah. If you have any questions as I go along, please ask. No. We talked about pressure canner. Yep. Is pressure canner and a pressure cooker the same thing? Well, as I say, a pressure cooker sometimes can be very small, okay? But if you have a pressure canner that's usually it's about the same size as this, you can also cook in that too. So you'll have a pressure canner cooker, okay? But then you'll have also a pressure cooker that's just little. You know, that you might like to do a little pot of beef stew in. What about the okay. story? I heard about pressure cookers and, you know, right. the right. right. It's and most of the time it's people who did not know how to use them properly. Okay. Or um, oftentimes inside the lid of the pressure canner, there's a gasket, <laughs> and you want to make sure that that gasket is not cracked and brittle. So um, that might have been the problem. Um, or that they, they um, you know, didn't have the, the weight on correctly. They might have put it on, put it on really high temperature, and then walked away from it, and not were not watching it to see if the temperature was maintain, being maintained. So there was probably a lot of error involved in that. And it, it, but it also could be equipment too if they didn't use it properly. But if you buy a new canner and you follow the manufacturer's directions. You know, you usually vent the canner, you get all the air out of it first while it boils, then you put your weight on it, and you evade your heat so it leaves the right amount of pressure. They're very safe. They're very safe. But you have to watch it. You can't just put it there and go and do something else. No, right, it's not a crock pot, exactly. <laughs> very good. Okay, so as I mentioned, um, there's a lot of equipment involved with um, canning. And so I brought um, most of the equipment that you need to can, but I want to see if you know what all of this stuff is. So my experienced canners, this is where you're going to show off. <coughs> so this is, a, a, of course, a boiling water canner. And inside this canner, I have this. It's a little rusty, but still works. So, so what is this? You need to see the this is your jar rack, right. So you can place this on the side of your canner like that. You can put your jars in and then lower it in. And then, but I find what happens is the handles actually collapse in and go under the water. So sometimes it's hard to get, to get it out. So we're gonna look at another piece of equipment to help get your jars out. Um, but why do you have to have this rack in there other than to help you lower the jars in? To keep your hands above the uh, bottom of the can so they don't bang each other and break. Exactly, exactly. We wanna make sure that those jars aren't sitting directly on the heated um, bottom of the pan because I couldn't crack it. All right, so the next one I have is, um, all right, so we have this. So that's our jelly jar, right? That's our canning jar, exactly. And when you um, have your jars, what are some of the things you do with your jars before you put your food in there? You wash them, you sterilize them, and you check them for cracks. Check them for cracks or nicks or anything like that because you want to make sure they're good shape. I was looking at this jar and actually there's this little bubble right here on the side here, so I have to make sure I don't don't use that in the future. And then I have this, and I have this. Lids in your screw band, right? And that's what you put on your jar. And then when you screw it on, you want to just do it so it's finger tight. You don't want to right down too hard. You want to just do it finger tight. Um, and, okay. Um, this from like last year, the year before, is there a use? Well, as long as you use them within five years is what they recommend. Okay, okay that's fine. Um, the other thing is these are a single use item. So once they've been used, you don't want to reprocess with them. You, of course, you can put it on the jar and screw it and put it in the refrigerator. That's okay. But you don't want to save these. Once it's gone, just throw this away. Um, the reason for that is, is because when you um, um, can it, the, the edge of the, the, you know, the edge of the jar here actually makes an indentation in this little rubber gasket material that's in the, in the inside there. And um, it causes like an indentation. 
So it's very hard um, to get another good seal again once you have that indentation. So it's not like you can't use them, but if you use them, it's going to, you know, your seal's not going to last as well. So that's why we say always use a new lid um, so that you have a good seal. The other thing, too, is, um, is you want to make sure you use this type of jar with the two-piece lids when you can. Um, you might have some really old wire bale, what they call wire bale jars, which are, are great for nostalgic um, purposes or to store dry goods in there, you know, like beans or buttons or whatever else you want to store in them. But do not use them for canning. And the reason for that is, is because with that glass lid that's on the top, there's no way that you can check to make sure that you have a good seal. Can you ask if they could be just a smidge quieter over there? Because <laughs> I hear, I hear lots of sort of loud voices. Thanks, Martha. So, so you want to make sure that you can check the seal to make sure it's sealed properly. They do still sell the rubbers that go on those glass jars. So it's not like you can't purchase them, but again, USDA um, wants you to make sure you have a really safe product and one that's sealed. So that's why they recommend using the, the two piece lids here. Um, okay, so how about all this stuff here? Like measuring cups, measuring spoons. Why do I need this? Obviously, you know, these are measuring spoons. Well, you've got to measure the ingredients that you put in there for the, uh, the um, Exactly. When you, when you make any kind of canned products, you want to follow the recipe exactly. All right. When you bake, when you make, or when you make stews or soups, you can put anything in the pot you want. But when it comes to things that go in a jar that you're going to can, you have to make sure the recipe is exact. So if it calls for two pounds of tomatoes, make sure you have two pounds of tomatoes. If it calls for a cup of vinegar, don't just take the vinegar and just sort of, well, that looks good. Put in two cups or whatever the recipe calls for. So it's very important that you do have measuring cups so that that's exact. Um, how about this? Funnel, right? And why do I need to use this? Okay, so it helps you when you when you put it in the jar like this and you use your ladle, which would be another thing, and you ladle it out of the pot, it just helps you so it goes into the jar and it doesn't go all over the sides of it. Um, you can, you don't have to use this, but then you have to be very careful as you pour in, and it's much easier with, with the funnel. Um, I know when I first started canning, I didn't have a lot of this stuff, and I kind of just sort of jury-rigged it. I, I did fine, but it was like, oh, it was a mess, you know, and this was, this makes life a lot easier. Um, how about this? Right, so this is what's called a jar lifter. And you basically just grab it around the edge of the jars like that, squeeze the handles together, and then you can lift this up, put this into your boiling water canner, and then when you're done, you can just lift it out and then you put it on the you know, table to cool there. So this, again, is another invaluable tool. I had a really old one that really didn't work very well, so it was nice to get a, one that really does the job. Um, how about this? This is my favorite tool right here. Right, okay, so this is for the lids. Because you also need one of these, and does anybody know what you need this for? Boil the lids. Right, okay, so you, that's, you heat them up. You don't yeah, boil them. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> so, so what you do is you'll have a small saucepan filled with a little bit of water. You're gonna heat that up to a boil, and then I kinda just bring it down, let it just sort of stay warm or simmer. Um, and what you need to do is you need to heat your lids up before you put them on the jars. So I take my lids, throw them in there, let them just sit in the hot water. And then, of course, now it's hot water in there, so you can't reach in there and grab it. So I used to use tongs, and you're like kind of trying to fish it out with tongs, and it was really hard. This is wonderful. You just stick this in, magnetic lid, it pulls it out, and then you can take, put it on the jar like this, all right, and then put your screw band on. So this is, this was, is like a great little tool. I love this little bit. Interesting thing about heating lids. Um, I was just reading that um, Ball, for the brand new lids that Ball is putting out, they recommend that you do not heat them. What was, ha and I think the reason why that was happening is, or why that's, uh, the changes, is because what people were doing is they were boiling water. They put the lids on, they boil them to death, and what happens is that gasket material gets really soft and was kind of like slipping off the lid. 
and so a lot of the jars were, were failing. So what I recommend is that if you don't have new lids, read the back of your package. So I, this, this box is pretty old here. Um, but you want to read the directions, and this direction says to heat them up. But again, don't boil them. Just sort of heat them in hot water. You just basically want to soften that rubber gasket just a little bit so that when it hits the rim of the jar and, and you seal it, it's going to have a good um, adherence to the, the edge of the jar and seal properly. But you, you read that on, did you get new ones and read that? Yeah, I got it from um, an email from Simply Canon. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, I think that's, I think that might have been where I saw it too. Um, another thing, how about this? Like a little plastic yeah, spatula. Go around the edges and the bottom, the edge of the bottom. Exactly. So when you put when you put things like um, pickles in or you know your peaches, sometimes you can get air bubbles trapped in there. So by going in around the edge with this, you can release those air bubbles. And this does not scratch the jar. If you do it with a knife, you could potentially scratch the jar and uh, cause it to break. So this helps release the air bubbles. The new um, spatulas like this that Ball puts out now have like little steps on the end of it. And so you can use that to measure head space in your jar. And we'll talk a little bit more about what head space is. But um, it's, it's kind of a neat tool. I have, I have yet to pick one up. I have to look, look see if I can find one. I haven't been able to find one. Um, how about this? Paper towel. <coughs> right, before you um, put your lids on, after you fill your jars, you should always take a wet paper towel, just kind of wipe off the edge. Even if it looks really clean, clean I always just give a little wipe, and then I put my lid on and the screw band on. If there should be any food left on the surface here, that's going to interfere with the rim of the glass and the gasket. And uh, what can happen over time is that can mold, and then again, that will cause your, your lids to fail. So that's why we always wipe, wipe it first. Um, then we have this little timer watch. I need that. Exactly, right. So you know how long, if it says 15 minutes, you need some kind of clock or something to keep an eye on to make sure that you're, you're processing it the right time. And then the last thing is that I'll show is this. Why do I need this? <coughs> right, when you pull, pull your jars out, you want to have some kind of cloth, or you could use like a wooden cutting board to put your hot jars on. You don't want to put them on your counter because if it's laminate, it could, you know, um, uh, singe the laminate or burn it. Um, if you put on granite, who knows, you know, that cold granite could cause your jars to crack. So it's really important to have a, a, um, some kind of cloth towel or some kind of uh, cutting board to put that. Um, your jars on um, Just a few other things that you might need, of course, are um, you know your cutting boards, knives to cut things up. You might need um, a potato masher to mash or crush fruit if you're doing jams or jellies. Um, and of course, the ladle works really nice to help you spoon it out. Does anybody use anything else that I didn't show here? Pot holders are good too. <laughs> when you get ready to can. What's the first thing that you do? I'm trying to set up stations on uh, how to go from one point to the next point to the next point. Because, I mean, you, really, you have a little bit of long time between when you put them in the, the uh, bottle and then the, the water bath or water bath. Mm -hmm. Exactly. You kind of want to set up like a whole flow in your kitchen, get all of your equipment together, you know, make sure you have enough of your product and all your ingredients, all that kind of thing. So that, that's really important. How about some other things that you do? Once you kind of get that all set up, then what do you do? We have to wash all your fruits and all that. Right, so you want to wash all your produce that you're going to can. Mm -hmm. Sterilize your jars. So it's good to wash them first. Yeah. You know, right before, yeah, before you sterilize them. Some other things you do? So we've got to assemble all your equipment, make sure it's clean. Sometimes, you know, this is down the basement, so it's good to clean that out first before you. Very important that when you can, you always should use products that are at their peak. 
Um, you don't want to use products that have any signs of um, mold or decay or bruises on them because then you're not going to get a very good product inside and it also could be a source of contamination. Um, the tomatoes I have here came from La Valley's that I, I picked up the other day, so those are nice, ripe tomatoes. I would be careful though if you see bags of what they call canning tomatoes. Mm -hmm. um, oftentimes those are tomatoes that might have cracks in them um, or slits in the skin. Um, they might be really severely bruised. Those are fine, you know, I guess if you want to make tomato sauce and then use it, that's fine. But if you're going to can, I want to, you, you want to use um, good, fresh product. Um, I noticed as I was pulling my pickles out of my bag tonight, should I be canning these pickles? Or these cucumbers into pickles? <laughs> no, so these are ready for, ready for the compost thing. So make sure it doesn't have any mold on it or anything like that. They just didn't survive very well since June. <laughs> um, so don't use overripe products. The other thing too is overripe products. Um, Especially if you use overripe fruit to make jams or jellies, your jam or jelly may not gel as a result of that. So you do want to make sure you can throw that back there. Of course, wash it, which you mentioned, um, and then plan for that two to three hours to do this whole process. Um, what else is a, a good thing is that, of course, your canner has got a lot of, it's going to have a lot of water in it. Usually you fill it up to at least like the bottom of the handle here. It takes a long time for that water to come to a boil. So usually I fill that up first, get that going, and then I start working on everything else because it's going to take a while for that to come to a boil. Um, prepare your jars and lids, which we did. Follow the recipe exactly. Um, so headspace. When you fill your jars, um, can anybody tell me what headspace is? It's <laughs> better to see here on this one. Um, Right, so it's the distance from the, the bottom of the lid, or the top of the lid here, to the top of, or the, where the liquid line is of, of the product. So this little air space in here is what's called head space. Why is that really important <coughs> to make sure you put in the right amount of head space? Does anybody know? Because if you put too less uh, head space, then it's going to come out when you boil. Right, so if you, if you do it like right up to the top and put the 